What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your daily session. HODL that Bitcoin. Before we dive into the news, just a couple quick things. Number one, shout out to sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin as collateral for a couple of different services, one of which is to obtain a Canadian or US dollar loan using your Bitcoin as collateral, and the second of which is a Bitcoin savings account where you can earn interest on your Bitcoin paid in Bitcoin. For either of these, check out the link down below, and if you do opt to get a loan, they'll actually credit your account with an additional $50 worth of Bitcoin. And secondly, if you're into Bitcoin, then privacy is important. And one of the things I use is NordVPN. I have this on my computer and my phone. Essentially, it masks your IP address. It helps encrypt your browsing data. And it has the added benefit of being able to unlock geo-blocked content. So if you want to check that link out down below, they've got a deal where you can get it for three bucks a month. And with that, let's dive into the news. Uh, so this is uh, kind of a, a, I don't want to say rehash, but basically the same thing has happened that happened before, and that is the U.S. Treasury blacklisting Bitcoin, and in this case, a Litecoin address. Um, and so these addresses, who do they belong to? They they belong to Chinese nationals that are apparently drug kingpins and, and basically are just... Um, yeah, they, they, they traffic drugs and narcotics and so on and so forth. Um, so they've actually specified a number of these are the Bitcoin addresses that they have uh, indeed uh, basically blacklisted. If you're in the U.S., you're not allowed to send to those addresses. So definitely don't do that. Um, yeah. And so uh, the, what I find interesting here is is besides the, the point of who these people are, is it it kind of speaks to the fact that the treasury is still very much behind the ball when it comes to Bitcoin in general. Um, One, let's talk about blacklisting a singular address. Like nowadays addresses get reused not that often, although in this this case, uh, I went through these addresses and they have been reused, but it's so simple to just create a new one and mobile wallets almost all of them do it by default. Once you've received funds to a singular address, well, it creates a new one for the next incoming transaction. So already there, there's a problem and they haven't really solved that by blacklisting these single addresses. Um, Secondly, uh, I mean, do you, are you, you can't actually stop the transaction. You can't prevent the transaction from happening. So there's that. Um, and I mean, I looked at these addresses, some of them still have funds in them, but most, you know, a number of them have already been cleared out. Clearly they've just moved the money to somewhere else. Um, and beyond that, let's, let's take a look at, at, how somebody would circumvent this, how these guys might circumvent this themselves. Well, one, they can be first mixing coins uh, using, you know, whatever wallet they desire. They could be using Samurai or Wasabi or whatever. They can mix coins and kind of obfuscate um, where they've come from. Um, Or people sending to these people could be doing the same thing. So already there's the, the, <laughs> that's that's not um, easy to figure out. Uh, number two, what about if somebody were to mix coins, use it to fund a lightning channel that is uh, uh, basically linked through Tor and then send back and forth because lightning transactions are essentially you can't see what's going on. So already um, there's just levels upon levels of of this not being effective. And and I'm not I'm in no way advocating for sending money to international drug kingpins, but at the same time to to single out what however many addresses they have here, what like 10, something like that, 10 or 11, to single out a few addresses and be like don't send money here is it's <laughs> it's like having a gaping wound and putting a tiny band-aid like in the middle of the open wound and expecting it to stop the blood. Uh, it's not going to work and I don't I don't know what they can do to try and exert any force on this kind of stuff because honestly it's just not going to work. And um 
they're going to have to go back to regular police work instead of being able to choke off the funding for things like this. They're just going to have to do regular police work. And if somebody's doing something illegal in their own uh, locales, then sure, they can prosecute that individual there. But on an international stage, that's that's pretty damn difficult. And maybe you could, if somebody's not careful with privacy, you could prosecute somebody for sending money to those addresses. But at this point, it, again, they're so far behind the ball that I don't really see this getting any easier for them. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have much else to say there. It's just like whatever, what they've done here will not work. Um, and I guess I'll leave it there. Let's move on. Uh, so a while back, Cryptopia was uh, this is a New Zealand exchange. It was hacked and a lot of their millions upon millions of dollars were stolen from them. Um, well, the uh, essentially what's happening here is Grant Thornton is tasked with going through and auditing everything, seeing who owns what and figuring out who gets what with, uh, with the payouts as far as like trying to make people at least a little bit whole again. Um, now, <sighs> What I found interesting about this article is is the title and and some of the main themes here. It's that Cryptopia basically they didn't use individual customer wallets as if that's a thing that regular exchanges do. It's not. Um, that's typically not how exchanges are operated. The way it works is an exchange will have a number of cold wallets where hopefully the majority of the funds are held, so not accessible to their main network. And then they'll have a hot wallet that holds any day-to-day -day funds for for um, withdrawals of customers. And if it exceeds what's in the hot wallet, then they have to go to the cold wallet and send some money over to their hot wallet for those quick day-to-day -day transactions. So um, typically, user funds are pooled in this way, and it's just the internal ledger of the actual service that keeps track of who owns what. So I found it odd, and it wasn't just Bitcoinist that had had this uh, this headline. I mean, CoinDesk and Coin Telegraph were speaking to basically the same idea, like this was irresponsible. But that's it's just kind of how it works. Um, I I think it would be very very onerous to have an exchange that had individual wallets for each individual person when you're dealing with trades and quick movements like that. I it's I just don't think it's practical. Um, so anyways, uh, regardless, Grant Thornton is going through and trying to figure out who owns what. Um, and it's going to be a hell of a process because, again, it's they have to go through each individual user and like millions of transactions and figure out uh, what's what's going on and who should get what. Not only that, but the people that are going through this and trying to get money back, they have to actually, it's mandatory that they go through full KYC. And some people on Cryptobia have already done that, others have not. Uh, so regardless, even if you have already done KYC, you have to resubmit through their process yet again, just for the chance to get some of your money back. Um, yeah, so that's that. Let's move on to the next one. So Peter Wooler, uh, this is the guy that uh, created Segwit, and he came out uh, with um, a new scripting lan language for Bitcoin that um, further enables uh, complicated smart contracts within Bitcoin. So if you're unfamiliar, Bitcoin already does have smart, smart contracts. So things like um, multi-sig addresses, uh, those are smart contracts where you have three keys and you say that as long as you sign with two of those keys, you can move money. That is a smart contract. The issue with smart contracts on Bitcoin is you can't have very complex ones yet, but that changes a little bit with this. Um, so this is called Miniscript, and it is built for Bitcoin as it is right now. So no protocol changes have to be made. No consensus breaking changes have to be made. Um, and it enables you to do more complex things. So in that instance, I mentioned before, so an example that they use here is, is what if an exchange, an online exchange has two of three multi-sigs? So there are three CEOs, each one has a key, and in order to move money out of their cold wallet, you need two signatures or two people to sign off on that transaction. Well, what if one of those individuals 
instead of just having a regular key, their setup themselves is also a multi-sig. So they say that they, they have like a two of three and they have you know, maybe a couple different hardware devices in different locales. And just to sign their portion of the multi-sig to move the, the funds in the, in the exchange, they actually have to do a multi-sig themselves where they get one device, sign, go to another location and sign. And that provides a single signature for the two of three on the exchange. Um, so you can get into more complex things like that with Miniscript, which is kind of cool. It, it adds additional functionality to the already existing smart contracts in Bitcoin, and uh, I'm happy to see it happening. I mean, anything that pushes the protocol forward, wonderful. Um, and then I'm gonna touch on one other thing here. Uh, this is CASA, so I have my CASA node behind me here running, purring away as usual. Now I did do a video on the CASA node, how it works, how to set it up and everything. I will link that down below. Um, but they've just released something. It's right now it's invite only, but pretty soon it'll be rolled out to everyone. It is the Sats app, which is a, a mobile app for your phone, which is Android or iPhone now, um, either one, and it connects to your Bitcoin and Lightning full node. And the way it works is you can now access your Lightning wallet, which is, is a full Lightning and Bitcoin node, remotely from anywhere on the planet and be able to utilize your lightning wallet that way in a in a trustless fashion um, and so what they've released here is is a way to earn sats for running your node and there's going to be multiple ways you can do this this is just the first one that they're presenting to people this is called node heartbeats and so what it does is from I believe Sunday to Friday, something along those lines, um, you can check your node remotely via the app to make sure that everything is running well. It'll basically send a signal through their server to your node, which is connected via Tor, so it stays private um, and they can't see your IP address, but it checks that your node is up and running and everything is healthy. And it takes a few seconds to do. There's a quick way of doing it through the app. Um, but basically you get this little heartbeat thing and if every all is good, then it gives you a little heart and tells you that everything is solid and running on your node. If you do that five out of those six days, so Sunday to Friday, if you do it at least five of those days, then on Saturday you will be rewarded by being able to stack 10,000 sats. So they'll send 10,000 sats as a reward to your app. Now this is obviously like a, not a lot of money, but at the same time, it's a few seconds a day to quickly check and make sure your node is up and running. And so what they said is that this is just a way to incentivize people to keep a healthy Bitcoin and Lightning network to make sure that we have maximum uptime on our nodes and uh, it's as decentralized as possible because we have more nodes consistently up and running. And I think it's a great idea. I think it's really cool. I, it's minimal effort on the part of an individual just clicking that button every day and getting some sats at the end of the week. And uh, kudos to these guys. Uh, it's, you know, the sats app, I've been playing around with it. It's still obviously it's it's not out officially this is just kind of some beta testing that is is going on right now um, i've been playing around with it obviously you know the odd bug here and there but uh the user interface is quite nice it's pretty intuitive and i look forward to this being built upon even more in the future so yeah again if you want to check out my video on casa node it is linked down below and i'll also link this blog post here as well and you can actually on the casa website reach out to them to be part of the beta testing you can sign up for that and get an invite as well and with that, guys, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new here, of course, hit like, subscribe, and share. Always share. I'd love to get more eyeballs on any of my videos. If you want to help out the show in another way, you can hit up either of the sponsors, uh, Leaden or Nord. Those are linked down below. And if you really like what you saw, you can always drop me a Lightning Network tip at my tippin.me page. And with that, I'm out, you guys. Have a wonderful evening, and I will see you tomorrow for your daily session.